So here's the deal. I've been moving into a new home for what's starting to feel like an eternity. Moving is always a terrible process, but moving in the middle of the summer has been... Yeah, it's been bad. The problem is, I have a lot of junk, and junk is heavy. You know what else is heavy? Books. And I own a ton of those too. Books from my childhood, my adult life, and everything in between. Plus, a decent-sized manga collection that just adds to the pile. You see, a younger, dumber me used to try and collect full manga series, but I eventually gave up on that. And thank god I did, because carrying all these volumes of Tokyo Ghoul from car to car and up and down stairs takes a real physical toll. My back! These days, I just read manga digitally and stick to collecting only the first Tankabon of most series I read. Moving my small collection of Volume 1s has got me wondering, what is my favorite start to a manga series, and more interestingly, what makes for a great opening chapter? I could use a good distraction from shuffling boxes around, so how about this? Let's take a look at the first chapter of 10 different manga series and see if we can piece together the right way to start something new. And while we're at it, let's give them letter grades. I know the internet likes to compare things. Sound good? Great. So this is the list of titles we are going to be looking at today, and you might recognize a few that I've already covered in other videos on this channel. In order to grade them, I've come up with three basic goals that any good opening manga chapter should strive for. In my mind, a good first chapter will achieve one or two of these goals, but a great S-tier first chapter will probably hit all three. Goal number one, establish interest. Any good manga needs to make its audience understand why it's interesting, and do that relatively fast. Manga usually either takes place in fantastical settings that are different and more interesting than the real world, or they star characters who are either already fascinating or are made fascinating by circumstance. In this world, almost everyone has superpowers. He's a pirate who can't swim and is made of rubber. This notebook grants you the power to kill. These are your back-of-the-book details, the hook that gets you to read the rest of the series. We as an audience need to get a sense for whatever that X-Factor is, and we need to understand it quickly. Goal number two, visually impress. Manga is inherently a visual medium, so the first chapter of any given series should work to display the strengths of the artist working on it. If a manga has a unique art style, the first chapter is a great opportunity to show off that style's strengths. If the genre is action, this might be your first big punch. If you're going for something hyper-realistic or detailed, this could be your beautiful double-page spread of Tokyo or some other city. But let's be honest, it's probably Tokyo. Regardless, a manga's art should be at least as engaging as its story, and probably more so. Also, no matter the genre, an interesting character design is almost always a plus. So if you have time to sneak in a cool design or two into your opening chapter, you know, maybe do that. Character designs offer a great opportunity for more confident or experienced mangaka to flex their talents and make their art stand out that much more. Goal number three, capture spirit. When you've finished the first chapter of a new manga, you should have some sense for the kind of series you are getting into. Not so much the plot or hook like with goal number one, but more the vibes that the manga is trying to establish. A comedy manga should make you laugh, a horror title should unsettle you, and a romance should give you that warm, fuzzy feeling. This goal might be the hardest for a manga to achieve in one chapter, but it's really important. A first chapter that misrepresents what makes a series enjoyable will fundamentally fail as a sales pitch. I can think of several manga that start off on the back foot because they include content in their first chapter that just doesn't fit with what their story ultimately becomes, and we'll talk about a few of those throughout the video. Speaking of which, if you'd like to skip around to different manga series in this video, I've included time codes in the video's description that will let you do just that. While you're down there, consider liking this video or leaving a comment letting me know your favorite manga opening. There are thousands of manga to choose from, and the list I'm looking at today is mostly covering manga in my personal collection, so it's definitely skewed towards my go-to genres, authors, and publishers. I can only read so much on my own, so I want to hear from you all about what I might be missing out on. Anyway, let's kick this off by looking at the start of what might be the most famous manga of all time. 
The story that later inspired an amazing rap song and this channel began in a small harbor village. One Piece Chapter 1, Romance Dawn, is a textbook example of how to draw readers in to a new, exciting world. The chapter starts with Roger, the previous King of the Pirates, but he's only shown for one page. The rest of Romance Dawn is more focused on Luffy's origin story, how he became a rubber man, and more importantly, how he was inspired to become a great pirate by another. If you're able to think back to 1997, pitching One Piece to Shonen Jump was probably pretty tricky. How do you convince a magazine editor that it's possible for a series to star pirates, not as villains, but as heroes? Well, Oda does a great job getting ahead of this potential problem by focusing his first chapter on Shanks. The red-haired pirate teaches Luffy, and the audience reading, what it means to be a good pirate in the One Piece universe. Being a badass is certainly part of that equation, but being loyal to those you care about is just as important. Shanks is a walking contradiction, a pirate who is ultimately selfless. His sacrifice to save Luffy from a sea beast is a shockingly impactful moment between two characters the audience is meeting for the first time. I think it's safe to say that One Piece Chapter 1 aces all three of our established goals for a first chapter. I'm immediately invested in Shanks and Luffy's dynamic, and I can't wait to read more about their adventures and see their eventual reunion. I'm still waiting, in fact. We haven't talked much about the visuals, but they also do a good job conveying One Piece's unique mix of silliness and violence. I particularly like how the first member of Shanks' crew to fight back against the bandits is not Ben Beckman, who looks the part of a badass pirate, but Lucky Rowe, who has a much goofier design and is always sporting a big grin and a hunk of meat. That's what One Piece is all about. If you can't have fun or learn to care about others, you'll never achieve the strength needed to become the King of the Pirates. It's all spelled out in just one chapter. This is easily an S-tier opening. Let's jump from 26 years ago to this summer. Wild Strawberry is a new title being released right now by Shonen Jump digitally. Monster plants have overrun Tokyo, and they eat humans for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Kingo, our main character, lives in the mostly overgrown city, where flowers are stronger than guns. He's shown to be holding up a store with a flower, in order to steal food for his... his beloved younger sister. A girl named Kayano, who has been infected by one of the monster flowers, making her extremely dangerous to others. You see, people infected in this world by plants tend to explode. And we are shown this happening several times in gory detail. The chapter focuses on Kingo trying to protect his sister from the government, who hunt down people that have been infected by the plants. He believes his sister is still herself and vows to find a way to cure her in the future. It's an okay enough premise, even if it feels very derivative. But I think this opening chapter fails to get readers invested in the siblings' relationship before they are torn apart. Their background is only briefly touched on, and it doesn't help that Kayano barely speaks or has any real discernible personality. King goes not much better. All we really know about him is that he wants to take his sister to a restaurant like a normal family that doesn't explode. This setup feels more like a collection of tropes that just happen to be red hot right now. You've got your ultra-violent action, your brother-sister leads, and the good old become a monster in order to fight monsters trope. It's tired. And yes, it's too early to tell whether Wild Strawberry will grow into its own, but for now, it's hard to get excited about a series with characters you can't really get invested in, even after a hefty 83-page chapter. By the time everything in Kingo's life starts to go south, I find it hard to care about whatever happens to him, and I certainly don't feel like the manga has done enough to establish its own unique identity. At least, in every way but one. Wild Strawberry might fail to establish interest or much of an identity in its story, but the manga does manage to impress visually. It takes advantage of its status as a digital title to sprinkle in some color in a few different pages in the first chapter, and the effect is pretty great. I particularly like how this page works in a little bit of color at the bottom before the next hits you with a full page spread introducing Kayano for the first time. She brings color into his world, and her condition can be just as beautiful as it is deadly. It's good stuff. It's also neat to see color worked into the middle of a manga chapter instead of at the beginning or end, which is more typical. I've only really ever seen this trick in one other mainstream manga, and it's one way Wild Strawberry manages to be super creative. 
I'd give the chapter as a whole a C. Sakamoto Days is a comedy series focused on juxtaposition. Taro Sakamoto is both a legendary ex-assassin whose name strikes fear in the heart of the underworld, and he's an overweight clerk enjoying married life. His two identities are so drastically different from one another, and that's the joke. It seems impossible that someone could look like this and still pull off John Wick-like feats. Early on, the greatest strength of this manga is its character design. It's so integral to the title that it's literally the manga's logo. Sakamoto's retired form is hilarious. His round face and mustache give him an almost walrus-like appearance, but his glasses hide his eyes, which helps to maintain the impression that this character can still be strangely menacing. The early section of this first chapter is structured around revealing this gag. We are first shown present-day Sakamoto from behind, before we cut to flashback. In the flashback, the younger, skinnier Sakamoto is shown to be pretty ruthless and even terrifying. But that version of the character, built up in the first few pages, is shattered pretty quickly and humorously by the panel where he falls in love. Shortly after, we get to see the new and improved Sakamoto with his new wife and daughter. Not only has he gotten out of shape, but he's also changed in other material ways. He's swapped out his flowing trench coat for some gag t-shirts, and he's also traded smoking for an instant ramen addiction. But the gag doesn't stop there. Through the eyes of Shin, another assassin who can read minds, we get to see another side of the retired Sakamoto lurking just under the surface. Shin's mind-reading ability lets us take a peek at the violent solutions Sakamoto could employ to deal with his problems, but that he chooses not to. When this happens in the first chapter, it's both shocking and wildly entertaining. And that's the strength of this gag and this series as a whole. Mixing together more hard-boiled visuals with a character as silly as Sakamoto is a recipe for a really good time. And this first chapter's art and structure demonstrates that very well. A tier. When a mangaka creates a series on a more obscure subject, they put themselves at an immediate disadvantage. In addition to having to introduce your characters and your basic plot, you also have to begin to explain the rules and techniques behind the subject you are exploring. Rakugo is about as obscure as it gets. It's a tradition relatively unknown outside of Japan, and that makes it a difficult fit for the internationally circulated pages of Shonen Jump. What I'm trying to say is that for the first chapter of Akane Banashi, every page, panel, and line of dialogue has to work that much harder at selling you, the reader, on this story. And I've already dedicated half of another video on this chapter because I believe Akane Banashi excels at doing just that. The series follows Akane, a Rakugo protege determined to prove to the people in this profession that her technique is worthy of the storytelling tradition. She wants to do this not out of pride for herself, but for her father, who first taught her to love the practice. He's actually the subject of this opening chapter, and it's from his perspective that we first experience the highs and lows of trying to make it as a professional Rakugo performer. Rakugo might not be as easy to understand as subjects like playing a sport or swinging a sword, but anyone reading this series knows what it's like to feel inferior to question your own ability in the face of enormous pressure. That feeling is what Chapter 1 of Akane Banashi zeroes in on. In what amounts to a 50-page short story, we follow Akane's father Shinta as he tries to bounce back from a lackluster show and prepare for a Rakugo performance test that will determine his future in the profession. At first, Shinta's performance and practice feels lackluster. Only in the eyes of his daughter does his storytelling begin to come alive. Through her eyes, we see a preview of Shinta's true talents buried under his doubts and anxieties. As he warms up, the manga's art becomes more stylized to match his growing storytelling prowess. And this panel is just a preview of what's to come when Shinta finally takes the big stage at the end of the chapter. Akane Banashi sets up Shinta's performance test beautifully. Even if the reader does not yet fully grasp the mechanics behind Rakugo, they will understand what's at stake for this character, and how important it is for him to succeed. So, at the end of the chapter, when he rises to the occasion and still fails anyway, the manga's first chapter twist is that much more affecting. I'm not saying anything else, go read Akane Banashi. Let's talk about first impressions. 
Berserk is one of the most important and influential manga ever to be put to page, and it's the rare, ultra-popular series that actually lives up to its critical and commercial esteem. The late great Kentaro Miura spent 30 years crafting a complicated world full of fantastical obstacles and very human reactions to those obstacles. It's a text rich in character, contemplation, and compassion. Berserk's world is a violent one, but its protagonist Guts harnesses his own proclivity for violence and twists it into a tool with which to rally against universal injustice. Berserk's first chapter lacks most of the depth and artistry the series has become known for, and I think it fails to show off the manga's strengths, at least where writing and character is concerned. It feels more like a 14-year-old's understanding of what makes Berserk great. A big sword, a cool monster to fight, and a whole lot of blood. I like Berserk as an action series quite a bit, but the manga's enduring legacy is more concerned with the swordsman, not the sword. Knowing the places the series will go, it's hard to believe readers are first introduced to Guts as he's getting it on with a demon, before yelling, The only one trapped is you, bitch. BITCH! Be careful, Guts. You might cut yourself on all that edge. That's how Berserk starts, in medias res, with a bit of violence and a cheesy line. And the rest of the chapter is similarly pretty straightforward. Guts mows down a bar full of baddies, meets the elf Puck, gets captured, escapes, mows down more baddies, fights a snake person, sets him on fire, and the chapter ends with a promise of more fights to come. Visually, the Black Swordsman chapter does score points for establishing some of Berserk's most important recurring visuals, and it largely knocks those out of the park on day one. This is the first time readers get to see Guts in all of his gory glory, and the cloak, knife bandolier, and metal arm combo is just killer. Don't get me wrong, it's really hard not to smile when you're first introduced to the weapon much too big to be called a sword. I love Guts' design, and every time it's referenced in pop culture, I can't help but get excited. Whoa, whoa. Berserk probably could have survived as a series on its art and rule of cool designs alone, but I'm glad the manga ultimately had a lot more to say than this first chapter does. I'd give it a B. Attack on Titan's first chapter is a hard one to evaluate, even knowing that it is the starting point for a franchise that later ballooned into an undeniable global phenomenon. It's one of the most significant starts to a manga this century, but to me, I've always felt like Attack on Titan's manga was, and in some ways still is, overshadowed by its anime adaptation. It's hard to measure just how successful that first season by Wit Studio was, but I really remember it setting the world on fire and being one of a handful of titles in the first half of the 2010s to help kick off the online anime streaming era. I also tend to think the anime's viral success had a lot more to do with its rather shocking pilot, and the most talked about scene from that pilot isn't adapted from Attack on Titan's first chapter. The violent event that sets everything in this series in motion actually happens midway through Chapter 2. Chapter 1 is the calm before the storm, and it's mostly focused on introducing the manga's main characters and easing the reader into this strange, walled-off world. There's not much in terms of action, but there is some great setup happening here. Scenes like the Survey Corps returning from a failed mission and the Wall Garrison slacking off on duty help to establish some of Attack on Titan's big ideas about the human costs of freedom and complacency. The chapter also ends rather ominously, with the first appearance of the Colossal Titan, which breaks all of the rules we have just been taught about this world and how safe it truly is. Unfortunately, the art in this chapter can't really keep up with the scale of its ideas. The walled-off city is lacking in visual detail, and the expressions of characters in emotional moments are often either too stylized or overly simple. This is author Isayama's first major work, and I don't want to be a dick, but it does kind of show. The good news is, the art in this series does improve dramatically over time, but this early on, it was definitely more the story winning the day. Overall, I'd give this chapter a B. Undead Unluck starts terribly. Here's a tip for starting your manga off well. Don't make one of your main characters a creep in the first chapter. 
This is a good series with one of the best leads in any jump manga running right now, and I can't recommend it to people because the whole first chapter is centered around this character getting repeatedly assaulted by this character. I'm really sick of my life feeling like that one harddrive.net article where the guy can't recommend a series without a bunch of caveats. It's like, yeah, the manga gets really good after you get past the high school girl getting felt up multiple times in the first chapter. If you're trying to sell a manga and an anime like this, just know you sound like a crazy person. When it's not being frustratingly creepy, Undead Unluck is an interesting battle series with some neat story beats and some especially creative powers. The main character, Fuko, fights using the power of bad luck, and she transfers that power via touch. She's kind of a superhero, but she can't shake someone's hand without risking their life. This manga's greatest strength is exploring how its characters' monkey's paw-like powers pretty much always ruin their lives. Fuko can't risk getting close to people, and Andy the Undead, our other main character, is cursed with immortality. The author really considers a lot of creative ways these two characters can work together, and sometimes, even in this mess of a first chapter, it can be really sweet. There's this nice moment when Andy gives Fuko her first haircut in years because he's not in danger of getting hurt from her powers. It's one of a few tender moments in this chapter buried underneath a lot of jokes about copping a feel. The art is fine, the story is interesting, but this is a mean-spirited way to start a series with a whole lot of heart. Don't make me tap the sign. Don to Don is, unfortunately, another manga that, for whatever reason, feels like it has to put its main female lead in a compromising position right off the bat. I know I'm harping on this a lot, but it's important. You might be able to ignore this kind of stuff, but it's a real barrier for entry for others, and that's both completely understandable and a real bummer. It's just unnecessary, uncomfortable to read, and it takes away from what is otherwise a really excellent start to an absolutely bonkers series. Don to Don's first chapter is a lot like the series as a whole, unapologetically bizarre, hilarious, and horrifying. Our main protagonists, in one night, discover that both aliens and ghosts are real. Momo is abducted by aliens, and Ken is cursed by an evil spirit that looks like this. The two engage in a frantic battle against aliens using occult-like powers, and they become friends in the process, as one does. The action is clean, the monster designs are A+, and you get a pretty good sense for what makes these two characters lovable in just one chapter. It's solid. Mysteries are almost the perfect candidate for this kind of review. No matter the medium, it's a genre centered around raising questions, and paying those off, eh, somewhere down the line. I've never personally sat in a writer's room or tried to pin a manga, but I have to imagine asking a few questions and laying out some intriguing details is a lot easier than coming up with satisfying answers. That brings us pretty neatly to the first page of The Promised Neverland. The lady I fondly call my mom is not my mom. The children I live with are not my siblings. This is Grace Fieldhouse, an orphanage, and I'm an orphan, or so I thought. Precisely dished out narration with just the first signs of menace. The Promised Neverland excels in its first page and chapter at raising all sorts of interesting questions that immediately make you want to keep reading. Who is this woman who is not mom? Who are these siblings dressed in all white? And why does Emma, the child speaking, have an ID tattoo peeking out from under her collar? These are some of the first of many questions you will be asking this chapter, and Emma's narration will keep making interesting observations throughout to make sure you notice at least some of the oddities that define the Grace Fieldhouse. The orphan's days start at 6 a.m. sharp, with a delicious breakfast that is always followed by the daily test, where the children must answer seemingly random questions to measure their intelligence. Afternoons are for play, and the children are allowed to roam the fields as long as they don't go near the gate to the outside world or travel beyond the fence in the local forest. This fence is my favorite detail in the whole first chapter. It's only a few feet high and seemingly unguarded. Emma or her friends could easily jump over it to see what lies beyond. The only thing stopping the kids from doing so is the absolute trust they have in their caretaker, which allows them to continue believing they don't need to know what lies beyond this point. It's a tantalizing detail that is visually and symbolically evocative. 
Look, I read The Promised Neverland years ago, when it was still coming out. I know what lies beyond the fence, and the answer to every major mystery in this series. Some of those answers are satisfying, some less so. The manga as a whole is not something I look back on fondly, but I will always remember that fence, and the gate, and the testing, the tattoos. This is everything excellent about reading a first manga chapter, and I remember knowing, knowing The Promised Neverland was going to blow my mind when I first finished it. Or so I thought. I thought I'd try something a bit different for the last, first chapter on this list, so I decided to look at the start of a manga that I haven't read before. For this fun little end of video experiment, I landed on trying out the series Freerin Beyond Journey's End. Before reading this chapter, all I knew about Freerin is that people like it, and it's about an immortal elf. By the end of my reading, that's still mostly all I knew about this manga, and that's actually perfectly fine. Freerin, from what I can tell, is a more gentle series compared to the other manga we've been looking at throughout this video. It's about what happens to your typical adventuring party after they've already defeated the big villain at the end of their story and essentially retired. For the elf mage, the ten whole years that she spent with her companions went by in a flash, as did the fifty years apart since. In 50 years, the hero of her party is now an old man, and he passes on shortly after their reunion in the back half of the chapter. This is not presented as some dramatic revelation, it's just the natural conclusion to a long life. If I had to identify some sort of conflict in this chapter, it would be Freerin's difficulty at recognizing how age affects her human companions differently from her. At her friend's funeral, she is moved to tears and expresses some regret for treating their relationship so flippantly. There's no twist, and there's nothing to spoil. The action in this series occurs in the margins, and all the conflict is internal and understated. What I'm trying to say is that my grading scale doesn't really fit a series like this, and that's okay too. You can honestly boil down all of my grading criteria into one simple question. Do I want to keep reading? For Freerin, the answer is yes. Or, more accurately, I'm probably going to watch that two-hour special that just came out. From what I can tell, the characters seem charming, the art is quite beautiful, and the big question it's asking about time and how it affects relationships really shines through from the jump. There are many different ways to start a manga, just like there are many different kinds of manga in general. Focusing too much on how they start is a fun experiment, but if you get too hung up on first chapters, you'll be bound to miss some great slow burns. Freerin's first chapter doesn't have any hooks to keep you reading, but it doesn't really need them. It's not that kind of series. I guess what I'm trying to say is that reading different kinds of manga like this is fun sometimes, and you and I should try and work on broadening our manga horizons. Also, rankings are kind of pointless. Well, that just about does it. Ten manga openings ranked and reviewed. I didn't think it would take me until the first few days of fall to finish this project, but the good news is I'm fully settled into my new place now and ready to start putting out videos a bit more regularly throughout the rest of the year. As I mentioned at the start of the video, I'd love to hear your personal rankings down in the comments below, or any thoughts you might have on manga openings in general. It's a topic I've become strangely passionate about in the last few months. Oh, I should probably mention that you might be seeing bits from this video repurposed into different shorts throughout the next few weeks. I'm not planning on becoming a shorts channel or anything like that, but I wanted to experiment a bit with promoting videos like this in a new way. I just thought I'd give you all a quick heads up.